simply concluded our 12 week course uh, live discussion uh, live session discussion so what was this course all about so the aim of this course was to develop an in depth understanding of various methods of repair retrofitting and rehabilitation techniques for concrete masonry and steel structures in the 12 sessions that we had for different construction materials our discussion was oriented along the understanding of following four points these points are to identify different causes and different types of deterioration to study different evaluation of the existing condition of infrastructure along with the material for repair and retrofitting the maintenance and the strengthening technique uh, we studied seismic retrofitting and design of retrofitted structural components and we also addressed challenges, uh, challenging issues for efficient retrofitting and rehabilitation. Okay, so to cover these uh, discussion points, the sessions were distributed uh, in 10 modules uh, to discuss several things uh, starting from week 1. Uh, where we discussed an overview to the course along with the discussion on concrete deterioration and we ended at week 12 where we discussed the retrofitting of uh, steel structure. Okay, so what we'll do in today's session, we'll just have a recap of everything that we have seen in these 12 sessions. Okay, so those who have followed the sessions regularly, for them, the, this session will be like an highlight of the entire course which will help them to just summarize whatever they have learned and it will also help them to recap easily to whichever module they wanted to uh, they want to revisit again and for those who have not uh, uh, who have not been regular in the sessions these session will tell you what all things you, that you have missed and what all things you can look ahead later on in the youtube channel or in the nptl uh, course so we started the course by introducing the diversity of infrastructure and their need in day-to-day -day life. We saw some major infrastructure projects like residential buildings, metro lines, bridges and uh, we saw how these things contribute immensely to the GDP of a country. Okay, Now these structures, uh, though they are assumed to have an infinitely long uh, lifespan, they face several reasons to encounter immature degradation or deterioration. So these deteriorations, uh, what they do, they generate distresses in the structure which ultimately lead, lead, uh, leads to collapse and loss of life. Okay, uh, we can see in the images also several such examples where uh, degradation has happened which has led to severe collapse and uh, discomfort in the society and thus retrofitting and rehabilitation becomes a vital part of a construction industry. So if we see the similar, uh, if we see similar thing from a structure service life point of view, so due to deterioration, the performance of a structure decreases, uh, decreases with time. Okay, now suppose uh, if the structure goes as per the planned uh, deterioration date that we have planned during the design, the time to reach a minimum uh, performance limit uh, that is service life is represented by this gray line okay so uh, along this line my structure's performance would de uh, degrade if uh, there is no severe degradation happening okay and my service life what it will be it will be represented by this mark okay so this will be my planned service life however due to aggressive deterioration my performance uh, will de decrease at a much faster rate uh, which is represented by this yellow uh, orange line and thus the service life that I will get it will be reduced by a very big margin as uh, compared to what I wanted. <coughs> so if retrofitting and repair is done properly uh, as you can see by the green dotted line uh, it will inc uh, this will inc uh, de decrease the rate of degradation uh, and in turn it will increase the uh, service life of the structure and we will be able to reach the design life of the structure. Okay, so this is the ma major purpose why we go for retrofitting and re rehabilitation. Now to discuss uh, retrofitting and repair things, the course was divided into 
ten modules. Okay, so in this, the first module was for deterioration of concrete structures. Okay, so degradation in concrete can result from several reasons. These reasons are generally categorized into six categories. The first and the most critical one being the material related distresses. Okay, by material related we mean uh, distresses that can appear on a material level degradation, like due to steel or aggregate or cement. Okay, in this we talked about four major reasons. Okay, the first one being corrosion of embedded reinforcement. Okay, where the embedded steel uh, de degrades and it becomes uh, weaker to carry the tensile strength and as well as the concrete cover also uh, degrades uh, due to the stresses that are generated by the rust formation. Okay, then we talked about acid attack uh, which mainly occurs in sewer lines where, where uh, the uh, sulfuric acid it degrades the cement hydrates and aggregate cement interface which lowers the concrete strength. Then there is sulfate attack uh, which causes expansive stresses uh, build up inside the concrete due to delayed ettringite formation and finally there is alkali aggregate reaction which also causes expansive stress generation within the concrete and this leads to cracking of the concrete. The second category of degradation of concrete is the distresses due to weathering action. So these are basically due to the exposure condition which can be related to the environment or to the load. Okay, so these things mainly affect the durability of the structure. In this we talked about four reasons. First one being freezing and thawing where uh, which generates expansive stresses in concrete due to the pressure gradient created by ice formation and ice decomposition. Okay. Second is the thermal effect where improper joint detailing mainly in the road pavement causes cracking. Why? Because there is thermal expansion during summers in a restrained condition which can lead to cracking. Uh, third is shrinkage cracks which, uh, which occurs due to loss of moisture uh, from the concrete and they are often very critical at the initial stages of construction. And like uh, and may become critical in high temperature concreting and finally we talked about creep in concrete which occurs due to sustained loading at higher level for a longer period of time. Then the third category uh, of distresses in concrete is a design or load related distress. Okay, this includes uh, load like compressive strength, uh, tensile stresses and shear stresses which are generated due to uh, different uh, which are generated in different concrete members due to live load, dead load and sudden loads that are acting. Okay, so we talked about how these, uh, how when the my concrete fails to bear these uh, different kind of stresses, how the stresses appear on the concrete. Apart from these three major categories, we also talked about construction related distress, uh, several reasons for it like high water to cement ratio, poor compaction, inadequate pouring, curing, foam work not be placed properly, improper placement of rebar, improper cover thickness, poor quality material, removal of uh, foam work, early removal of foam work. So these all come under construction related distresses. We talked about foundation related distresses which lead to which is basically due to settlement or due to poor uh, foundation quality and we discussed some other uh, distresses uh, also which includes natural calamities like earthquake, floods and tsunamis while accidental calamities like fire damage or explosion. Okay, so this was everything uh, that came in the module A of the course. Now in module B, we discussed condition, evaluation and testing of concrete. Okay, here we address two main points, how to identify distress and how to evaluate the intensity of distress in a concrete structure. So in identification of distress, we looked into various forms of distress. Uh, on the count, we saw 12 types of distresses. So what were these distresses that we, uh, that we talked about? Uh, these were crazing, 
scaling, spalling, dusting, disintegration, pop-outs, honeycombing, buckling, seepage, delamination and erosion. So these were 11 categories of distresses that we discussed and the 12th one was cracking. Okay, where we saw both structural and non-structural crack, how they are different from each other and how they occur. Okay, and in what condition, what kind of cracking can occur. So, structural cracks are basically uh, uh, the... Huh. So, these cracking, they can occur uh, in two conditions. Before hardening also, they can occur due to foam work movement, subgrade movement, shrinkage or settlement. And cracking can occur after hardening also due to thermal stresses, chemical attack, weathering action, drying shrinkage, overloading, creep and soil settlement. Okay. Structural cracks are generally much wider and visible and they mostly affect the strength of the structure. While the non-structural crack, they are much finer and they mostly affect the durability performance of the structure. After identifying distresses, we saw how we can evaluate distresses. So, there are three ways in which we can evaluate distresses in a concrete structure. Either by conducting visual inspection or by using semi-destructive testing or by using destructive testing. So, first in the visual inspection, we, have, uh, uh, we saw several times that it is the most versatile and power powerful method. It is the first step of assessing any structure and the goal is to identify any vis visible signs of distresses, defect and deterioration. The same can be seen in the image also where how just by looking we can comment over distress, its cause and sometimes its in intensity also. The second category was semi-destructive testing. So in this we discussed pull out and pull off testing, penetration resistance testing, pore sampling and testing and carbonation depth evaluation. Okay, in, uh, uh, when we discussed pore sampling, we later saw also how from the collected sample we can further investigate, we can do further investigation using petrographic analysis like uh, identification of ingredients that were used in concreting and determining air voids, cracking and investigation of chemical attacks. Okay, and the third category is non-destructive testing. So in this we talked about rebound hammer, UPV, ultraviolet pulse velocity, electromagnetic cover measurement, half cell potential measurement and resistivity measurement. Each of these tests uh, test has its own significance that we have discussed. Like RH gives us the surface strength, UPV gives us the concrete integrity measurement, cover meter tells me the cover depth, half cell tells me the corrosion probability of the embedded reinforcement and the resistivity tells me about the pore structure and ion transport behavior through concrete. So this was module, uh, second module where we discussed distresses and evaluation of distresses. Now comes the third and the most important module of the course, general repair and retrofitting of concrete structure. So when we talk about degradation in concrete, the performance can be affected either because of strength of structure is not enough or the durability of structure is not enough to withstand the weathering action. Okay, so what, a rip what does a repair do? So a repair generally increases the durability of a structure to meet the initial condition without affecting the strength and it, it uh, this in turn reduces the rate of deterioration. And what does retrofitting do? So it increases the strength of the structure which in turn may or may not increase the durability and this will increase the performance of the structure. So we opt for repair when there is durability concern and while we opt for retrofitting when there is strength related concern. Now how these things come into play in a site inspection or um, f uh, while making decision. So, for this, we saw this flowchart, a very important slide, uh, like, I guess this sums up the entire course, okay. So, we have an existing infrastructure which is degraded, okay. Where is my mouse? Yeah. We have an existing infrastructure which is degraded. So, initially we will conduct a series of inspection on it, initially using visual inspection at initial stage and at periodic interval to know the state of the structure. 
once we discover some abnormalities in the structure, we will go for a detailed investigation using uh, semi-destructive testing and non-destructive testing. Okay, based on the result, we decide whether we need to go for repair or retrofitting. Now, how to make this decision whether to go for repair and retrofitting? So, for this, we do saw so that the evaluation can be done uh, based on five uh, criteria points by judging the functionality of the structure, by judging the safety of the structure, by judging the safe serviceability of the structure, the appearance of the structure, and the durability of the structure. Once we know the cause and the extent of distress and our choice, uh, we can select the appropriate method and material uh, needed uh, to go forward. We will prepare our existing uh, structure to carry out the required work by shoring, scaffolding and surface preparation. And then we will apply our uh, uh, repair method or retrofitting method. And finally, we will validate the process whether the things are done properly or not. Okay, so this is the uh, crux of repair and retrofitting of any infrastructure. Now, for repair of concrete, there are different criteria for ideal choice of material. So, these uh, criteria are it should be low shrinkage material, it should have quick setting behavior, it should have good bond strength, it should have sufficient uh, strength in itself, it should provide adequate workability, uh, per impermeability, it should be non hazardous and it should be durable and cost effective. Based on these criteria, different repair materials that are used for concrete repair uh, that we discussed were cement motor, polymer modified cement motor, epoxy resin, low viscosity sealing motor and waterproofing sealing components. Okay, now and uh, now how to apply these materials? So for that we discussed several techniques like grouting, routing and sealing, stitching and stapling, drilling and pl uh, plowing, pre-packed aggregate uh, placement, short creating and ferro cement application. So here you can see here grouting is done, uh, epoxy injection grouting. Here we can see pre-packed ag aggregate placement uh, was done. Here you can see routing and sealing is executed. Here drilling and plowing is done. Here uh, short creating is used and here stitching and stapling method is, has been shown. Now for cases where severe damage has incurred with at the rebar level and the reinforcement is also corroded. Uh, along with the concrete coro uh, deg degradation, we may also need to opt for some corrosion protection measures. Okay, so for such cases, we talked about different repair techniques specific to corrosion damage. So these were cathodic process control method, where we control the cathodic uh, reaction of corrosion, and these are also known as passive treatment, in which we talked about proper designing and detailing and coating on to the concrete surface. Then we talked about anodic process control method which is also known as active treatments and in this we have talked about electrochemical techniques, corrosion inhibitor use and coating to reinforcement. And we also saw metallurgical control method which involves use of special reinforcement like corrosion resistant steel and stainless steel. So this was all about repair of concrete, repair of concrete also and steel also. Now, for retrofitting or strengthening of concrete, it can be carried out in three ways, either by replacing or by attaching or by redistributing. So, for conducting either of these three measures, we can opt for uh, either high quality concrete or reinforcement steel bars or thin steel plates, strips uh, and tendons or fiber reinforced polymer composites. Now, how to apply these measures? So for this, we talked about five categories of uh, retrofitting techniques. So what were these five categories? So first one is the section enlargement, which involves addition of new concrete and reinforcing steel over the existing substructure. So here you can see the section enlargement that we discussed uh, that was carried out on column. Here also you can see column as an overlay or as a beam encasement, how section enlargement is carried out in beam. And in slabs also as a overlay or as a uh, as on the top of the slab or at the bottom of the slab, how section enlargement can be carried out. And this is done to enhance the strength and the stability of the structure. The second category is composite construction, which involves adding new plates and structural element to the existing cell structure. So here you can see FRP wrapping is done. Here you can see uh, steel plates are placed in the flexure side, and here you can see. 
the column is confined for using steel st strips okay and these uh, techniques are done uh, to increase the strength and the uh, st strength stiffness and the load carrying capacity of the members then we talked about post tensioning okay which involves placing tension uh, tension bearing components like steel plates rod tendons and strands okay so here you can see post tensioning being carried out in bridge decks externally or internally and here also you can see how using carbon steel post tensioning was carried out okay and this can be done either internally within the member or externally to the member and it release over stresses and reduces deflection due to bending or buckling then we talked about stress reduction that is to release stress within the structure and this can be done by cutting the expansion joint jacking the displaced structure and installing I, I, some isolated bearing or removing certain portions of a structure so in this we saw two methods this uh, the first image shows the slab jacking method which is used to fill the uh, defects uh, below the slab to get the slab at the same level again and we also discussed uh, strand splicing where uh, in case of uh, pre-stressed concrete bridge uh, when the strand uh, loses its tensile property how they are cut and how they are reconnected to reduce the stresses we also talked about grouting in this grouting uh, can be done in two types it can be internal grouting where pressure injection is done into the material using uh, nozzles and it can be ex external grouting where pumping material is done on the outside structure to fill any voids or any surrounding uh, uh, to save it from any surrounding contamination okay so this can also be a part of retrofitting measure now for each of these retrofitting techniques and measurement we went in deep to discuss their practical application for different concrete members like for beams slabs columns girders footings etc etc so this table presents you the summary of the of those discussion where you have uh, different structural members and their associated different strengthening techniques for them so uh, you can see for beams and slab if we take them as a single element or a t-shaped beam okay so for beams and slabs uh, shear strengthening can be carried out either by internal or external post tensioning or by adding new reinforcements and uh, flexural strengthening can be carried out by section enlargement externally bonded plate near surface mounting uh, span length shortening section uh, uh, section enlargement and attaching external steel supports for walls we can go for section enlargement or external steel supports for columns in axial for axial strengthening we can go for a section enlargement and for ductility strengthening we can go for a rc jacketing uh, for shear and moment strengthening we can use additional shear collars shear walls and shear plates for foundation strengthening we talked about underpinning and chemical grouting while for paver slabs we talked about slab jacking okay so these were the different methods that we saw in detail from both their um, theoretical point of view also and from practical point of view also we saw how these methods are used so okay so this was all, this was all about module 3 where we discussed repair and retrofitting method now there is one very special class of retrofitting material that has gained significant attention and application over the past couple of decades so these are fiber reinforced polymer composites okay so as a part of module d we introduced ourselves to fiber reinforced polymer composite and its characteristics so as the name suggests among different categories of composite material possible like particulate composite which is our concrete or laminate composite FRP is a fibrous composite which consists of fibers as a reinforcing element in the matrix of a polymer. So it is said that in FRP there is thousands higher volume of micro sized fiber reinforcing within polymer resin matrix. Okay, here fiber can be glass, carbon, aramid, ceramic or boron while polymer can be polyester resin, epoxy resin or vinyl ester resin. Now, which fiber and which polymer to choose it depends upon the individual performance uh, of the material and the performance of the composite that we need 
as we can see in the stress strain diagram also so my fiber has is more stiff but it has higher strength my matrix is not that much stiff but it has higher ductility so a combination of this will form a composite which will have both strength and ductility performance and to achieve a certain strength and ductility different fiber and different matrix can be used and their combination will yield different results so here you can see this fourth one which is carbon epoxy uh, polymer composite it has a very high strength but its ductility is comparatively low okay while in two uh, glass epoxy you can see the strength is decreased but the ductility increase so uh, depending upon our application we can design our own frp composite uh, we also discussed how frp orientation dis uh, dictates the performance of an frp saying that in the direction of fiber my frp will have a superior elastic property compared to in uh, perpendicular direction this provide, uh, property provides control over FRP laminate when we want to create it. Okay. Another way in which we can control the FRP property is by which uh, volume fraction of fiber and polymer that we are using. Okay. Along with their individual properties. Okay. So if we know the volume fraction of fibers or weight fraction of fibers, we know uh, and we know the elastic properties of these individual components then we can estimate the properties of a composite also so in this regard we studied the micro me mechanics of composite okay here one thing was high, uh, that we highlighted was that we highlighted strongly was the rule of mixture which says that the summation of product of volume fraction times the property of an individual component is the property of my final component so we saw how this summation rule of mixture applies for different types of property and how just remembering that equation of rule of mixture we can deduce every other relationship. While uh, now while knowing the theoretically how FRP performs, it is not enough. We also need to know uh, how FRP is manufactured. So uh, later on we talked about FRP manufacturing methods. In this we saw the three classification. The first one being contact molding where my F I, lay, I will lay fiber and polymer as an alternate layer. I will press them and roll them to form a composite. The second one is the compression molding where fibers and polymers are pressed and squeezed between two molds accompanied by high pressure and temperature to form a laminate. Okay. In this, we saw four methods. Uh, these methods were mesh dye molding, gas for forming gas employing high pressure, closed mold method employing low gas pressure, and pultrusion forming. The third method that we talked for FRP manufacturing was filament winding method, where self automation and continuous method is used for large scale production of FRP. Now, after discussing FRP in module D, we discussed about retrofitting of existing infrastructure in module E using FRP. Here, we through basic design understanding and past literature works, we understood all three criteria categories of FRP retrofitting that is flexure, shear and axial. Okay, so in, F, uh, in flexure, uh, we saw use of externally bonded steel plates. Just wait a second. Hmm. In Flexger, uh, we saw use of externally bonded FRP sheets, strips and laminates as well as near surface mounting of FRP rebar. Okay, as written here, we saw the basic diagram to understand what FRP is contributing in the stress strain distribution. In shear, we saw partial and complete wrapping of FRP sheets and strips. Uh, while in axial, we again talked about partial and complete wrapping of FRP sheets and strips and laid emphasis on the end radius discussion and how if how and and how it affects the axial strengthening of a rectangular column compared to a circular column. After this, we also talked about day bonding issues in FRP, where they are, where it is said, uh, uh, 
uh, where they are used as an external reinforcement okay here we talked about different kinds of failures like epoxy failure concrete failure and interface failure now to address this debounding issue uh, after discussing different more uh, different modes in which failure can occur we talked about different anchorage system okay so simply saying a uh, anchorage system is used to strengthen the bond between the frp and the existing concrete we classified anchorage system into three categories type 1 where external bolting kind of system is used type 2 where nsm anchoring system is used and type 3 where embedded anchoring uh, assembly is used okay so for each of these type we saw different anchoring techniques so these are frp u jackets uh, metal metallic anchor frp stripe anchor and pi pi anchors for type 1 anchoring for type 2 we talked about mechanically fastened metallic anchors patch anchors and nsm uh, nsm anchors while for type 3 anchorage we talked about anchorage through concrete embedment now since we understood frp we talked about uh, Of, uh, we talked about it from a design point of view so the basic rule for all three flexure shear and axial is after considering degradation reduction factor the strength of the structure after retrofitting with frp should be greater than the strength uh, required strength of the structure based on load increment or based on uh, what is the minimum value of strength for opc 53 for each of this we saw several numericals where we uh, distributed the solution in a step by step manner like for flexure the steps can be initial structure check material degradation parameter estimation determining effective strain in frp determining frp contribution to shear stress and then final check for strengthening similarly we talked about uh, similar measures for uh flexure also and for axial also uh, the difference will come in the final part where we are checking for shear or flexure or axial okay by this we ended our discussion on the frps then we started module f where we talked about concrete overlay for placement rehabilitation we discussed several reason which caused distress in pavement both bitumen and concrete pavements so these common reasons for distress can be repetitive loading due to moving, moving vehicle overloading of vehicle uh temperature and moisture effect subgrade failure deep foundation movement material degradation joint failure and improper mix design and compaction uh we first discuss several reasons which causes distresses then we discussed about inspection of pavement where we talked about visual inspection that can be done instrumental inspection like straight edge measure bump integrator and profilometer semi destructive te testings like core extraction and testing and trial pit assessment and non destructive testing like plate load testing and falling head deflectometer wherein for the last one we had a detailed discussion once we know the reason and extent of distress we talked about different overlay treatment methods so these were for concrete pavement it can be bounded overlay partially bounded overlay and unbounded overlay while for bituminous pavement it is conventional thin and ultra thin white topping so based on the degradation of road that the road has incurred any one choice of this, these methods can be done we saw one example also where overlay treatment has been executed near iit kharagpur campus so the steps that are followed here are first laying the concrete using fixed foam formatting uh, concreting then there is bull floating that is done to level the surface then the texturing is done on the surface then we uh, uh, cut the uh, we, then we use saw, saw cutting to provide transverse and longitudinal joints and finally finishing is done on the surface so this is how concrete overlay treatment is done for a placement in module g we talked about masonry structures so for masonry so masonry structure basically are the oldest building material that which still finds application in today's building industry and their most important characteristic is their simplicity so there are two these masonry structures are composed of two parts units and mortars so units can be bricks block ashlars adobes or regular stone while mortar can be clay bitumen chalk lime cement based mortar or glue 
masonry structure those seem to be very durable since they don't have any embedded uh, reinforcement for corrosion still they degrade over time uh, the common reasons can be settlement temperature and moisture effect structural overloading chemical reaction poor construction practice aging and wear biological growth and earthquake some of these examples can be seen in the image also like here you can see diag diagonal cracking that is generated that can be due to earthquake effect or due to this end restrainment here also you can see diagonal cracking which can occur due to uh, settlement okay and here you can see freeze and thaw deterioration that occurred due to weathering action uh, to evaluate these distresses we talked about different inspection methods uh, in which we talked about visual inspection non destructive testing in which we had a detailed discussion in understanding also and in application point of view also about ultrasonic pulse velocity ground penetrating radar and infrared thermography and impact eco testing while in destructive testing we talked about core sampling and testing and pull out testing once the evaluation is done we saw different repair and retrofitting methods so these were masonry repointing as can be seen in this image crack stitching uh, which is which can be seen in this image grouting uh, it is also one of the option which can be done okay here you can see the uh, reinforcement installation like here you can see reinforcement mesh has been installed surface coating and treatment here you can see anchor anchor installation here you can see in the arches structural strengthening you can see uh, here by reducing the length of the member and here you can see systemic retrofitting where cross plates were provided near weak points now till module g all repair and retrofitting we discussed were due to construction or exposure or material related distresses to address one very specific and critical form of distress in module h and module i we discussed retrofitting of building structure damage due to seismic event okay here we first introduced how earthquake generate seismic wave which can interfere with the structure and we saw richard scale for classification of intensity of earthquake damage we talked about how seismic assessment for of, of existing structure is conducted then uh, in which we discussed uh, uh, a visual inspection historical review of the structure or the place nearby structural analysis to judge the strength of the structure geotechnical investigation to judge the condition of the soil and seismic hazard assessment where all these components are combined along with the knowledge of the local area uh we uh, judge the uh, so we do the seismic hazard assessment okay for these uh, uh, and uh, uh, after uh, talking about seismic assessment we uh, saw how identify how we can identify vulnerabilities in structure prone to seismic damage okay so in this we talked about weak structural system uh, poor quality construction non ductile construction material soft story and weak story and irregularities in plane and elevation now to carry out retrofitting against earthquake damage there are three ways either we can improve the lateral uh, load uh, resistance of the structure which is represented here so if we will increase increase the strength of the structure then also my drift due to earthquake will reduce or we can enhance the ductility of the structure which will increase the ability of the structure to undergo deflection without causing any discomfort to the residents or we can uh, use uh, uh, we can go for improving the energy dissipation capacity in which less energy is coming to the structure and it is more dissipating before coming to the structure okay so for all these three ways can be achieved by four measures either by adding a new structural element or by strengthening the existing components or by modifying the connection or by redistributing the load for these we saw uh, two complete sessions we had we had two complete sessions of discussion to understand each method its practical application and its scale of application like here you can see in the first uh, uh, session we discussed about different kinds of strengthening solution 
how they will appear and what will be their benefits while in the second section we classified these different uh, strengthening techniques for earthquake damage into two levels at global level where the whole structure is taken into account and at local level where a specific part of structure is taken into account among these major ma measures for improving the seismic capacity of the structure we laid very particular emphasis on waste isolation how it is carried out at mid story level and below ground level and how it functions okay for which we also saw one case study of salt uh, city and county building in salt lake city in america where uh, base isolation was carried out and we saw around 400 base isolators were provided in that building to safeguard the building from any above uh, above le ground level damages and finally in module j we concluded uh, that we concluded two days back we talked about retrofitting of steel structure we talked why steel structure is preferred for construction due to its high strength to weight ratio durability versatile and versatility and flexibility speed of construction and sustainability we saw six major in, uh, in, uh, examples of steel structure which showcase showcasing these benefits we, we also saw, talked about what all reasons provide degradation challenges to steel structure. In this, we talked about design deficiencies, material degradation, environmental exposure, construction errors, and operational condition errors. Okay, we saw how performance evaluation of steel can be carried out using visual inspection, non-destructive technique like magnetic particle testing, ultrasonic testing, liquid penetration testing, radiographic imaging and remote sensing. For each of these categories, we had a very detailed discussion to understand how the te testing is carried out and what the testing will reveal. And finally, there is destructive testing like tensile strength, compressive strength test, bend test, impact test and fatigue test uh, that we discussed. And after all different, uh, and after all this discussion, we saw all different retrofitting techniques that are available for steel structure, going from strengthening part to seismic retrofitting to joint strengthening and use of corrosion protection measures, and finally against fire damage control. How we can retrofit a civil uh, steel structure? Okay. So these were all the 10 modules that we discussed in this course, starting from concrete, then coming to masonry, pavements, and finally ending at steel. We discussed how distresses appear, how we can visualize those distresses, how we can evaluate the performance of the desert due to after distress, and how we can opt for different retrofitting measures, and how we sometimes how also we can apply those retrofitting measures. Okay, so this was all about retrofitting and rehabilitation of civil infrastructure course. Thank you. Any doubts in any particular module that you have? If there are major doubts, then try to look at the module live session again. But right now, if anyone has any minor doubts, they can ask.